All right, everybody, it's a little after seven, uh, on at least uh, East Coast time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm really excited uh, to be doing this tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're amped to be hosting this discussion tonight about the history of anti-racist action with three authors from uh, the new book, We Go Where They Go, by PM Press. Uh, so Firestorm, if you don't already know us, we're a 14-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective um, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And we're continuing to do um, the vast majority of our events like this one online, uh, both because it feels great to be able to connect with people at a distance and also because we know that COVID is continuing to present a significant barrier to a lot of people in our communities. If you're interested in signing up for future events, uh, follow us on social media and I'll share a link to our newsletter in the chat. We send out maybe one or we're doing really good two newsletters a month and they often feature upcoming uh, uh, events like this. So please note that we are using Zoom's Q&A tool tonight. Uh, if you want to ask a question at any point, uh, just go ahead and find that at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're joining us uh, from Facebook, you can use the comments section on the stream. All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, tonight, we're joined by We Go Where They Go co-authors, Shannon Clay, Kristen Schwartz, and Michael Staudenmeyer. Shannon Clay is a student, historian, and community activist from the Mountain West Coming up after ARA had largely declined, he learned of its little known history through anarchist networks and saw the need to document and publicize its history for a new generation of activists. He's been involved in student organizing and in prison solidarity and abolition work. Michael Staudenmeyer is a veteran of many anti-fascist and anti-imperialist and anarchist projects over the past quarter century. Uh, including working with ARA Chicago in the 1990s and 2000s. He's the author of Truth and Revolution, A History of the Sojourner Truth Organization, 1969 to 1989, and many other shorter works of political analysis and historical scholarship. He works as assistant professor of history at Manchester University in Indiana and lives in Chicago with his family. Kristen Schwartz grew up uh, with the Toronto, uh, Toronto chapter of ARA from 1992 until 2003, and is grateful to have had the opportunity to contribute to the long struggle against white supremacy. Uh, she went uh, to work in community radio and has produced several audio documentaries, including Women, the Oppressed Majority, The Latin American Revolution, and Ravaging of Africa, some of which were syndicated across the Pacifica network. Her writing has been published in Our Times, Canadian Dimension, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, Monitor and Labor. Welcome, folks. Um, thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, your book has been just a real joy to read. I, I don't often have um, the experience of moving quickly through nonfiction. I actually read more fiction, uh, but I, I read the book in two or three sittings. Uh, it was just very hard to put down. Um, and as someone who came into radical politics um, around uh, Seattle, um, when ARA really was such a defining force uh, in kind of North America uh, for anarchists and the left as a whole, um, it really, uh, I don't know, it, it, it like hit a bunch of stuff that I don't often get to um, kind of uh, explore in contemporary uh, nonfiction. So I, yeah, can't recommend the book enough. And I know uh, I'm going to really enjoy hearing more about it um, and about the history that y'all discuss in the text. So thanks so much. I'm going to pass it off to Shannon. Cool. Um, thank you so much for the kind words, Liberty. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Shannon. Um, I'm one of our co-authors, obviously. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Fucking pumped. Um, I, we were just discussing, and I don't know how much y'all care, but for your information, we, the four of us speaking, like, see each other, don't see the audience. I know at least some friends of mine, I think my brother is in the audience, uh, 
thanks everyone so much for coming out. I unfortunately, we unfortunately can't see you, but we're all the more grateful to know that you're in the ether. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, for we were thinking for our format today, uh, we would the three of us speak um, one after another to start off sort of uh, covering both a chronological and thematic order of uh, the history of anti-racist action. Um, and then we'll open up to Q&A a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to get us started off. Uh, and actually, uh, I'm going to start with a reading uh, from the book, um, because uh, we think it's a really good encapsulation of what anti-racist action was. Um, if, if you have your copy, you can read along. It's page one. Um, OK. <clears throat> the Nazis had a wedding hall, but ARA had a baseball team. Near the end of May, it finally starts to feel like summer in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. It begins to feel like anything is possible, and optimism runs deep regardless of your politics. St. Paul's local neo-Nazi band, Bound for Glory, fresh off a show in Idaho in honor of Adolf Hitler's birthday, decided to plan a high-security concert in St. Paul for Saturday, May 20th, 1995, and the local branch of anti-racist action, ARA, decided to stop them. Years before, ARA had used physical confrontation to make it impossible for Nazi bands to perform publicly in the Twin Cities, and they weren't allowed to bet it, they weren't about to let it start all over again. Through what longtime member Kieran later called pre-internet age detective work, ARA determined that would-be Nazi show attendees had been told to pick up tickets and a map to the secret venue at a public park on St. Paul's East Side. On the day of the show, ARA-affiliated activists reserved a permit for a picnic and softball game in the park, but this was no typical ball game. The 90 or so anti-fascists who showed up shared one or two softballs, a handful of myths, and an assortment of about 75 aluminum and wooden bats. Those not playing ball rode bicycles around the perimeter of the park and used walkie-talkies to alert everyone when a suspicious car approached. Beyond the bats, one other weapon was on hand. An older comrade, a Vietnam veteran supportive of ARA, was positioned away from the group with a single concealed firearm. The agreed-upon plan was that the anti-fascists would accept a brawl and take a beating if it was unavoidable, but that if any fascist pulled a gun, this comrade was authorized to act as necessary. In the end, everything went right for ARA and wrong for the Nazis. There was no violence at all. Whoever had been expected to hand out tickets and maps never showed. A handful of cars with Nazi fans drove into the park, and each time, as Kieran put it, a large crew of community baseball players headed over to greet them. Without exception, the Nazis drove right back out again empty-handed. ARA salutes had also identified the concert venue, an empty wedding hall on St. Paul's west side. For a couple of days prior to the show, activists went door to door in the neighborhood to alert people about the hate to be unleashed that Saturday night. As a result, when the picnic and ball game had successfully concluded and dozens of militants drove to the venue to confront the band, they found hundreds of confused and angry neighbors already filling the street in a spontaneous protest. The neighbors wanted the show shut down at least as much as ARA did. The police and eventually even the mayor of St. Paul arrived on the scene to defuse the community's anger and quote, to avoid a riot end quote, according to Kieran. Quote, they finally announced that the show was being called off for public safety reasons, end quote. Police drove the band members and the few fans who had managed to show up away from the venue. The protest turned to celebration as the sun set on a warm, early summer evening. Um, so the uh, reason that we uh, began the book with that uh, little vignette and the reason that we're starting this event with it um, is because we really do think it encapsulates um, a lot of really key themes of what ARA was and, and how it worked. Um, so what was ARA? Uh, Anti-racist action was a um, militant, uh, broadly based uh, youth anti-racist activist network um, based primarily in North America, in the United States and Canada. Um, our book covers a history from about 1986, when it began in anti-racist skinhead scenes in the Midwest, to... Um, 2003-ish, uh, when ARA did continue to exist. It continued to exist until 2013, uh, when it renamed itself the Torch Network, and that's still active today. But we end our book in 2003 because um, uh, it, it was uh, significantly smaller and was starting to evolve into um, something else uh, by around that time. Um, but anti-racist action um, really basically uh, was both uh, basically defined like what uh, anti-fascism and what like the dreaded Antifa uh, really looks like um, in North America, um, especially now, like, you know, 20 years after the end of our book, very meaningful um, changes have happened and, and things have changed over time. Um, but uh, Antifa today would not really be what it is in North America without anti-racist action who um, began it and who um, 
were a really big deal just as far as like numerical participation. Um, hundreds of chapters, um, probably a, a thousand plus activists at one time or another, or especially including people who like, you know, were sort of fellow travelers or, or in the mix and showing up to events and things like that. Um, so a, uh, a very important and exciting story. Um, if I can find, or maybe I just have to go off of memory, um, those, again, sort of key themes that are specifically illustrated by the, um, by that story of them showing up to the baseball, uh, or showing up to the park and having their, their little softball game. Um, yeah, the way we put it in the book, uh, a commitment to linking mass mobilizations against fascist targets uh, with direct and sometimes violent confrontation by a militant core of anti-fascist activists. So um, we have in that story going door to door, leafleting, bringing just neighbors and everyday people out against Nazis in their own community, and also a more um, uh, a, a smaller, tighter knit group of people um, who are ready to be a bit more confrontational um, and strut around with baseball bats. Um, the skillful collection and wise use of counterintelligence uh, and the notion that the cultural terrain uh, constituted a political arena that, you know, like having a punk show um, is not just like an innocent party if it's Nazis doing it, that uh, culture and politics are, are intertwined and matter and that uh, connection matters. Um, so uh, that's a, a broad overview of ARA. And then, as I said, we're going to get into sort of a um, more of a chronological and thematic run through. Um, I will start us off just briefly with how anti-racist action started. Um, they began, uh, anti-racist action began in, um, as I briefly mentioned, anti-racist skinhead crews um, in the, especially the Midwest of the US and uh, as well as Canada. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure who's in the audience tonight. Um, not sure what people's backgrounds are. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, you say skinhead and uh, sort of in, the, the predominant mainstream um, understanding of that term and that culture, like you immediately think of racists and racism and Nazis. Um, but that was not always the case. And indeed, you know, still is, is not the case. Um, skinhead culture first arose out of uh, basically melding of white and black working class youths uh, in the UK. It was an explicitly multiracial culture um, of basically working class kids getting together and liking similar music and hanging out and going to shows and partying. Um, really, uh, you know, based sometimes on, on not a whole lot more than like, uh, being working class, um, their, you know, their classic fashion in the shaved heads and the Doc Martens, uh, and, um, oh, yeah. And so then it was, uh, in the, um, by the 80s in the US, you have these skinhead groups who are in the Midwest. Um, you have a group called the Baldies in Minneapolis, for example, who are um, a multiracial group of skinheads. When um, all of a sudden, uh, Nazis start showing up uh, or skinheads start showing up and they're going up to these kids and like asking who they are. And these kids are explicitly saying that they're white power. Um, and so uh, that really begins basically a turf war um, of anti-racist skinheads versus racist skinheads um, in the Twin Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis um, for control of like basically who is able to be uh, in local youth scenes and local spaces and, you know, venues, the downtown area, just like street corners where people would uh, hang out. Um, they really thought that, um, you know, the, the anti-racists who are beginning our stories um, thought that it really mattered, like, uh, if people could safely go to shows and hang out without being harassed or attacked by Nazis, and thought it mattered if, you know, Nazis had a safe space to um, be public and to recruit. Um, and so they weren't okay with that. And so you have anti-racist skinheads uh, pushing back against the racist skinheads in these crews. Um, they then... Uh, broaden it up a little bit um and the name anti-racist action has come up with to bring in not only skinheads into this fight but uh, other people who are in the same youth crews and so you have um in the case of minneapolis you had this crew the baldies and they create the name anti-racist action because they want to bring in you know hardcore kids and skater kids and hip-hop kids and they also bring in um to an extent they have some alliances with like local um sort of street gangs uh which is something that uh one person we spoke to in particular really wanted to stress that connection. Um, 
And they basically really significantly succeed at um, pushing the Nazis out of their uh, youth spaces and then also building up into something bigger. Um, Anti-racist action uh, goes a little bit wider and they're also doing, you know, like educational work and um, Chicago, for example, is uh, speaking to kids um, in, in high schools. That's because uh, this model is sort of pretty popular and getting picked up that a lot of different cities in the Midwest uh, are having this, these problems with Nazis around the same time um, and sort of realize through the connections of the punk scene at the time that they're going through similar things, get in touch with each other um, and build into um, that, you know, again, they're fighting the same fight and they want to create a, a, a sort of unified force that reflects that and that they are, um, again, fighting the same fight. Um, so you have uh, Minneapolis, you have Cincinnati, Chicago, uh, Kansas City, um, you have Milwaukee, you have Winnipeg, um, a lot of different cities where basically very similar things are happening. Um, all the way over into Portland, where it for a bit got very serious, where um, some Nazi skinheads murdered an Ethiopian man and student named Mula Vassara, and um, he, uh, and after that murder, again, the sort of local punk scene uh, and skinhead scene um, said that they were not okay with uh, these very violent Nazis organizing in their spaces. And so God organized to push them out. Um, and all of these, uh, yeah, again, just similar trends happening in various different cities and various different scenes. Uh, and that is the beginning uh, of anti-racist action. And what a beginning it was. Uh, so we're going to move on now and I'm going to pass it over to um, Mike, who's going to take us a little farther in the chronology and through some of the themes of our history uh, after anti-racist action began in the uh, late 80s, 1986-ish, through the late, um, yeah, through the late 80s in these uh, anti-racist skin hit scenes. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, it's uh, nice to be here. I can't, I can't see you all, but I'm happy that you're all here. Um, uh, so I was um, one of the three of the four of us co-authors uh, who was involved in ARA. And I often say that I was involved in what we sort of describe in the book as the peak period of ARA in some ways, which comes after that sort of early phase that Shannon just described, um, where uh, in many ways ARA is um, sort of closely aligned or defined by its um, participation in, in skinhead scenes in particular. Um, and so in a period that runs <clears throat> roughly from the mid 1990s until the early 2000s, um, ARA sort of uh, re-envisions uh, itself um, in ways that I want to um, describe uh, in, you know, in as much uh, brevity as I can, right? I don't want, I want to sort of get us to the point where we can have meaningful conversation and, and have some, some Q&A, but I, I want to focus on both uh, the context in which that kind of peak period of ARA emerged and also um, reflect on a couple of key accomplishments um, that we managed, particularly in, on the U.S. side. Um, I'm going to let Kristen um, talk in, in more depth about some of the stuff happening in, in Canada more or less simultaneously. Um, so in terms of context, uh, I want to highlight three elements because I, um, I think that in, in historical investigation, context really matters. It matters because it can help us frame and reframe uh, the activities that we're specifically focused on. So well, our book is about anti-racist action, but the ways in which we as co-authors um, think and wrote uh, and talk about ARA is dependent upon a couple of core uh, kind of aspects of the context within which ARA operated. Um, the first and I think really important one on a very macro level is that um, anti-racist action really is at its strongest in a period of what we would call neoliberal democratic control of the US government. And that that's basically the Clinton era, right? So um, Bill Clinton is the democratic president of the United States, um, elected in 92, reelected in 96. He's in office until 2001. Um, and then he's followed immediately by uh, what we could describe as the neoconservative Republican regime under George W. Bush, uh, which is um, in power then continuously up through 2009 um, when Barack Obama um, takes office. 
Uh, and in that time period, especially during the Clinton era, era but also in a different way um, under George W. Bush's presidency, um, there's really strikingly little uh, political partisanship, I guess you would say, of the sort that has become definitional really about uh, US politics today. Um, and that matters in the context of ARA's rise because when you have low levels of political part partisanship in the mainstream and you have uh, generally you know, some of the lowest turnout, for instance, in presidential elections in modern US history, um, that provides openings on both the left and the right for people who have more radical agendas to be able to make um, a case for themselves. And it's in that context that ARA really begins to, to thrive. At the same time, we also have to acknowledge that it provides an opening for our core opponents, people who are on the extreme right, uh, what you might think of as a determined fascist core that operated in that era overwhelmingly outside of uh, the mainstream of American politics and importantly, outside of the Republican Party. Um, and that way, very different than the, the sort of far right white nationalist threat as it exists today, where a portion of that threat is um, interior to the Republican Party. Um, so that's, that's context number one. Context number two is that on the left, there is a small but vibrant radical uh, movement largely identified with young people and largely identified with a kind of cultural politics. We we went back and forth. We were working on this book about what do we use the word subculture. I don't even remember what we decided whether that when that was appropriate or not. But definitely the notion of a, 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 a politics that's infused with uh, cultural questions, whether those are questions of um, what music are you listening to? What kind of fashion are you wearing on your bodies, right? To demonstrate your political commitments. Um, but in that context, this is a generation, I guess technically most of us are Gen X, right? Um, the generation that is weaned on the politics of punk rock. It's also weaned on the politics of, uh, of militant hip hop. And it's weaned on um, you know, experiences with militant feminist and queer politics as they emerge in the 1970s, 1980s, and into the 90s. Um, and that's really important for understanding how ARA develops in the way that it develops. And then the third kind of context point that I would like to, um, to just sort of uh, put front and center is ARA was never an anarchist organization. Um, we were deliberately, avowedly, proudly non-sectarian and included people from all kinds of left ideological backgrounds. But anarchism was really crucial in the moment in which ARA is emerging, in part because this is a post-Cold War movement where uh, anarchism had a, a sort of this brief flowering in a lot of ways, especially um, in the period uh, you know, before, during, and after the, the Seattle experience in 1999. Um, but anarchism was pivotal within ARA in part because it led the way in rejecting other kinds of anti-fascism. It led the way in rejecting um, liberal notions of anti-fascism, and in particular, in rejecting statist responses to fascism. Um, uh, the, the, the point of unity that says, um, we don't rely on the cops and courts was really heartfelt in the sense that we thought the way you stop fascism is not by getting fascists arrested or putting them in prison, but rather by confronting them militantly um, in the streets. Uh, and that's, that's, I would say, the third kind of key moment of context or, uh, or point of context that I wanted to highlight. And, th and then I want to talk very briefly about some accomplishments. Um, this is one where I think we tried really hard as authors to avoid um, uh, being boastful or overly uh, estimating our power, our influence, our, our legacy as, um, as ARA. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, we accomplished a lot, right? As a, as a, on one level, as a decentralized network, lots of the victories, like the opening vignette that Shannon read, um, they're very local. And 
we you know did our best to try to capture some of those in our book, but of course, no book can do everything. And the story of ARA is so diffuse, so dispersed in a way that we couldn't possibly do justice to many of the victories, many of the accomplishments of ARA because they're precisely local, relatively small in scale, and sometimes are, are forgotten um, because we simply weren't able to, you know, to kind of reach out to make contact with any number of people that were actively involved in, in ARA in various places around the United States and in Canada. Um, but if you want to talk at the, the bigger picture, the macro level, as it were, I would suggest that we um, had two different kinds of successes. Uh, and one of them is our successful ability in a couple of different important contexts on uh, a continental scale to undermine the far right, to make it very difficult for the far right to succeed um, in its own organizing efforts. Um, and then the second success is that I think we did a really magnificent job of modeling a process for mass militancy. And I wanna highlight those two terms because often they're seen as incompatible. Um, and yes, there's a tension there, uh, which I'll talk about momentarily, but I think that what was great about ARA in many ways was the ability to bring those two things together. Um, so to highlight some of the successes, I wanted to quote briefly from a few different spots in the book, um, because I think that is, uh, you know, hopefully a helpful way to give people a sense of what's in the book. Um, but also I think a lot of times, the people that we interviewed in particular really spoke quite eloquently, um, and I want to highlight some of what, what they had to say. So first off, in terms of our you know, kind of successes in making uh, things more difficult for um, major far-right operations, I, I want to highlight specifically the work we took on, especially in the middle part of the 1990s, against the sort of many-headed hydra of the Klan. We, we often think of the Ku Klux Klan as a singular organization. By the time the 1980s and 1990s rolled around, it was more like a thousand little clans. Um, and ARA devoted significant attention in the mid-90s, especially in the Midwest of the United States, um, to uh, combating uh, the Klan and confronting the Klan wherever it um, sort of tried to make a public stand. Um, and this is uh, just one paragraph from the conclusion of the book on page 256. Uh, ARA organizers in the US Midwest and even toward the South, particularly Louisville, worked hard to deny a platform to KKK groups seeking to build a base in smaller cities and towns through regular rallies. As Columbus ARA member Jerry put it, ARA might get one car each from 10 different chapters, put that together and make it work. ARA both worked alongside and very often were the locals showing up in the streets. But whatever the details, one thing was for sure. Anywhere the Klan was, ARA was there to oppose them. Quite simply, says Jerry, we ground them down. Faced with relentless opposition on the ground, no Klan leader or group could develop momentum. While direct causation is difficult to establish, we want to come close. Anti-racist action was ferocious in undermining Klan organizing. Klan groups faced with this opposition fractured repeatedly and their membership declined through the 1990s. Something quite similar. Shannon, you got something? Jerry, Jerry is in the audience today. Oh, hi, Jerry. Know that. That's great to know. Yeah, I was, I was reading through the <laughs> participant list just for fun. So yeah, All thanks, right. Jerry. We love <laughs> hi, you. Jerry. Um, I think this is the first time Jerry's ever seen my face. <laughs> Um, I think that same uh, basic uh, process also applies to one other major campaign that we described near the end of the book, um, which is a uh, sort of multifaceted effort to um, harass and undermine uh, a far-right organization that was called the World Church of the Creator, the WCOTC. Um, and then subsequently, as that group tried to develop uh, a sort of coalition with a larger and older and more established Nazi organization called the National Alliance. Um, ARA groups from across the United States were active in this campaign. And at the same time, this is where we try to be really careful with our, our claims, right? Um, we did a lot of work to make things hard for 
um, these various far right organizations, uh, but we can't take credit for uh, you know, the fullness of their troubles, in particular because if you look at the World Church of the Creator, unbeknownst to all of us in ARA, their very high-ranking um, security uh, head was an FBI informant um, who helped, you know, uh, develop a set of legal charges that brought down um, Matt Hale, who was the leader of the World Church um, during the time that we were um, fighting them. Uh, and, you know, similarly, uh, there's a, a level of external pressure um, that brings to bear on a whole range of these far right groups. But it is, I think, still really important to keep in mind that ARA is out there in this time period between the mid 90s and early 2000s on a consistent basis, really making life miserable and difficult for uh, far right organizers in ways that have real impact over time. The second uh, kind of success, I guess, that I wanna to point to um, is more uh, of a process point, I guess, than a specific content accomplishment. And that's the importance and indeed the difficulty of balancing mass organizing and militancy, right? Um, and here I wanna highlight two quotes from people that were involved in ARA um, and uh, who are also, you know, two of the many people that we um, spent a lot of time interviewing to uh, kind of work on this book. The first one is um, an old friend of mine from Chicago named Sprite. Um, and this is on page 241 where we're describing um, an action against the World Church of the Creator in York, Pennsylvania. Um, and Sprite argues, the problem with a lot of anti-fascist work is that it is quasi-legal or extra-legal. So how do you go about that work, but then still try to publicly organize and build an actual movement and get people out in the streets that are willing to be militant? We had discussions about that, and we were interested in building up a militant movement in that sense. And I want to just, again, emphasize that this was a notion that most of us shared in ARA was the need to balance or combine a level of militancy and the notion of a movement in a broad-based uh, and public-facing way. Um, that's a, a set of challenges that face today's anti-fascist movement in a very different way than they faced ours, right? We were uh, operating before the era of internet doxing. We were operating before the era of ubiquitous surveillance cameras everywhere you go, right? We were operating before the era of smartphones with cameras on them. And that changes the, the balance of questions regarding militancy and mass or public facing organizing, but we retain the conviction that it's important to try to combine those. And one possible path forward, and then I think I'm basically done and ready to hand off to Kristen, comes from another, I think, really um, great uh, quote in the final chapter um, from Steve, who was heavily involved in Lansing ARA for many years. Um, and Steve says, ARA wasn't like a cadre organization. It was meant to be a broad tent anti-fascist thing. So the kids who were just getting into anti-fascist stuff in high school at age 14 could come and there would be communists who've been doing stuff for, you know, 40 years and all in the same room, all learning from each other and all getting an experience that's meaningful to them that helps propel them to do some good stuff. And I just really like that aspect of what ARA represented in terms of its openness and its ability to bring people in at a wide variety of kind of levels of commitment, levels of experience. Um, and I just, I'll, I'll end with that. I think that's one of the real successes of ARA was its ability to, to make that kind of um, vibrant movement develop. And I'm happy to hand off to Kristen. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike and Shannon for getting this for, for taking us this far in the book. Um, before I get into talking about the content of the book, I just wanted to say a couple things about the process of it, because it's, I think it kind of exemplifies some of the cool stuff about ARA too. Um, so uh, Shannon was kind of the kind of the person who got it rolling as someone who hadn't been involved at all, like was too young to participate during the high, high watermark of ARA. Um, and, uh, 
but there were many of us who had been thinking for years, there really should be something. Something's got to be written. Somebody's got to do something, you know? And so once Shannon sort of got the nod from people that he'd interviewed and had, you know, he'd done some work on it academically, like once that happened, then the word got through those of us who were still kind of friendly with each other, but at a distance, like we haven't, you know, we haven't all been in touch since we stopped being active with ARA, right? But but that network's still there and we sort of decided, like a group came together to pool resources and try and make this happen. So there's three, three of the four co-authors were all directly involved. And um, so, yeah, we were trying to understand our own story in a way and tell our own story because nobody else is gonna do it, you know? Like nobody else is gonna give credit to the you know the you know the people who were involved in this type of work in a way right and um uh and because uh the work was it was unfunded I don't think anybody said that yet like there was not a lot of money in any of this there were no paid staff people really I mean there was kind of an office in Columbus for the the biggest period the, the most active broad ranging period uh in the mid 90s but you know this was all very off the books like informal the money that came into ARA chapters was all through like fundraising like concerts and donations and things like that right it's not uh yeah so as a result too it like the institutional memory wasn't really there either, right? So it's all in people's in boxes of clippings or <laughs> old flyers and posters in people's basements, like that's, or, you know, in their closet, right? And so doing this book was really about bringing that kind of stuff out, trying to put it together and try to look back um, and understand what was important about it, I think is fair to say, for myself anyway. Um, uh, and I also just want to acknowledge that we had the assistance of an editor who really made the book better. I mean, editors both at PM Press who challenged us to, um, uh, you know, to not, you know, when you're when you're writing about the activism that you're yourself are doing, then there's always this tendency to smooth out some of the rough edges, you know. Um, cause you're trying to make it kind of palatable. Right. And our editors at PM kind of challenged us to go a bit beyond that. Right. And talk about things that might make us uncomfortable. So I think uh, that was a valuable contribution from the publisher. Um, but then, um, they also gave us the feedback that our first draft was too long. <laughs> and so we found ourselves an editor that, um, we trusted, to go through our text who successfully cut about 20% of the words, um, but probably less than 2% of the ideas, you know? So it was a good trade-off, made a more readable book. Um, and uh, we hope that readers will appreciate that effort. Okay, so with all that said, I'm gonna just go into some content because I'm gonna kind of talk about the middle part of the book. Um, I'm joining you from Toronto, uh, Canada. I was part of the thriving chapter of ARA in the 1990s. And so for my part of this talk, I'm going to highlight some stories and lessons from the Canadian experience. And then I'm going to switch gears to talk about how ARA sought to contribute to broader anti-racist work and to the fight for reproductive freedom as well. Um, so looking back the close relationship between the ARA folks in the US and Canada was kind of special. And I'd say it's even uncommon. Um, and this happened largely because ARA was based in youth subcultures, uh, youth countercultures, which were spread, was all spread out mainly through zines and touring bands and word of mouth, like mostly pre-internet, right? Um, so people in Toronto got excited about the ARA idea because it was covered in Maximum Rock and Roll, the magazine. Um, uh, also, some people were connected to Love and Rage, the anarchist newspaper of the time and was an organizing project as well, um, which was uh, involved with uh, work against the far right 
neo-Nazi scene in Minneapolis in particular. And so Toronto people were sort of following that. So when we had our own far right problem, extreme right problem to deal with, the ARA, ARA ideal, idea was already kind of in the mix um, spread through those countercultures. Um, so ARA in Toronto was initially focused on exposing and opposing the Heritage Front, which was far right group led by fascists, which was really trying to reach a broader audience by soft peddling its ideas, um, talking about equal rights for whites and free speech, you know, um, rather than, well, I mean, it's pretty explicit, but <laughs> it's not as explicit as like the KKK, right? Even though there were past KKK people who were involved. Um, so for that effort, to kind of following the footsteps of David Duke uh, from the, you know, the 80s in the US, um, that effort was making progress. They were finding success. They were getting coverage in the mainstream media. They were invited to participate in talk shows, all that sort of thing. Um, and for a while, uh, the Heritage Front was described as the most successful extreme right group in Canada since World War II. Uh, there were many individuals and organizations who were concerned about the growth of the Heritage Front in the Toronto area. Uh, even before ARA had come on the scene, there were small demonstrations and there were a number of people who were trying out legal strategies to challenge them. And in Canada, uh, unlike in the US, there are laws on the books against promoting hatred against an identifiable group and laws against advocating genocide. Um, so while these laws aren't often used and don't come with very heavy penalties, um, they are tools which liberal anti-racists have access to. So there were people kind of working in that direction. Um, but uh, by the time, but ARA uh, emerged nevertheless, um, because it seemed like all of that wasn't gonna be enough, right? To contain and the threat. And uh, so when ARA came on the scene, uh, we really made it much more difficult for the front to keep growing. Uh, when they held events, we would try to challenge them same time, same place. We identified their organizing centers, uh, where they lived, where they worked. We held demonstrations there. Um, we exposed them with posters and in their neighborhoods, uh, with newsletters. We had a radio show. <laughs> Um, and we also participated in larger educational efforts, giving talks in schools and participating in larger community events and public discussions. Um, so the book tells a story about one of the more spectacular events when ARA found the address of one of the front's key organizers and took a demonstration there. That's about 100, 200, 200 or 300 people and outwitted police so that the people, the uh, anti-racist demonstrators had an opportunity to vandalize the building. And uh, this sent a big signal to the Heritage Front um, that they were going to be challenged. Um, and it prompted them that day to try to retaliate an effort that failed dismally and which really set them on a downward spiral. Um, so this story, which we go into in more detail in the book and others like it, epitomize some of the lessons that we wanted to pass on through the book, you know, um, that young people uh, can really make a difference when they work together to challenge injustice. I mean, most of the ARA organizers were between 15 and 25, right? There were a few older folks and we're very grateful <laughs> to them, right? Because they... Some of them were quite experienced from the you know, 60s and 70s and brought a kind of added sophistication to the group for sure. But really the strategies and the energy came from the young participants and that's really special, you know? And, um, uh, and it really, you know, really does show that the, this scene that kind of emerged out of these countercultures originally to confront racism within the countercultures, like then was able to have an impact beyond that in the society as a whole um, for a moment. So I, 
So the importance of youth, then the importance also of solid information about the far right, about their organizations and their strategies, and finding ways to put that information to use. So there are many people today who are far more sophisticated about data collection, you know, and information gathering about the far right. But that question of how to use it, I think, you know, continues to be, you know, it's important to try and figure it out. Um, and then uh, the final point about this, I think, is that Toronto ARA, like other ARA groups, utilized militant tactics, but it was an open group and engaged in public organizing. Um, there were people within the group who were focused on dealing with the media, uh, on connecting with artists, and lots connected with outreach and networking with other community organizations. And those three factors, I think, were part of what made our group successful and helped us um, to, you know, go beyond just Toronto and sort of nurture groups in other cities and towns across North America. Um, and, and, you know, with a focus in Canada, obviously. Um, so that public face and that all the networking and outreach, um, that's also, that kind of brings me also to the next part of what I wanted to share today. Um, the relationships that ARA groups had with other anti-racist campaigns and the Campaign for Reproductive Freedom. So our book has a chapter on each of these themes, which ran through the history of ARA, because ARA was not just about the far right. As we've seen, it emerged from efforts by people in the counterculture to keep fascists out, um, partly because fascists made the scenes dangerous, but also because the people in the countercultures had larger political interests, you know, like challenging police abuse or fighting for women's rights or LGBTQ liberation. ARA folks recognize that the extreme right, like the KKK and the neo-Nazis, uh, were part of a larger problem of systemic white supremacy. And practically speaking, many chapters tried to find ways to contribute to the larger struggles. And chapter five goes into this, like with stories from Minneapolis, Columbus, Toronto, Detroit, and Los Angeles. And we talk about the ways that chapters connected with or took responsibility for different types of anti-racist organizing. Um, for example, Cop Watch, where people would literally patrol the streets to keep an eye out for police brutality and document and try and intervene and assist people with asserting their rights. Um, some chapters were involved with prison solidarity, um, indigenous self-determination, supporting that, um, struggles for economic justice. Um, so uh, I think... Uh, Shannon acknowledged that uh, an old friend, Jerry, is on this call, and I just wanted to acknowledge David, uh, who was an ally of ARA from outside of Toronto, uh, and he taught us a lot about how racism against Indigenous people played out in rural areas or small towns, um, particularly in the struggle around hunting and fishing rights, and we tried to, um, uh, you know, take cognizance of that and contribute to awareness of that uh, in our work in Toronto. And I just, I think I just wanted to sh share that like the, the struggles around um, systemic racism would just would look different in different, different cities and towns, depending on the concrete things that people were dealing with. And then also what kind of relationships we were able to have. As you can see on this call, like there's three of us, we're all white people, um, but, um, you know, so we were all trying to connect with the larger issues, um, depending on, you know, pre-existing relationships or um, what what we could kind of touch in our own communities and towns. Um, so next, I just wanted to go to chapter six, which documents the single biggest political development within ARA which was the growing focus within the network on fighting for abortion access and reproductive freedom. Obviously still relevant today as the far right's legislative strategy and electoral strategy has been totally devastating for abortion access in the US. Um, in the 90s, the terrain was different. We were dealing more with kind of on the ground organizing by the far right by groups like Operation Rescue or Missionaries to the Preborn, 
Um, and there was like an extreme level of violence against abortion providers, uh, large, many, many arsons, bombings, assassinations, attempted assassinations of healthcare workers. I mean, it was really devastating. We tried to um, kind of reflect on that in the book. Um, again, uh, ARA chapters contributed to the struggle in different ways, uh, depending on where they were. So Minneapolis ARA worked with the LGBTQ community groups to confront a far-right Catholic organizing conference called uh, Human Rights and uh, Human Life International, it was called, um, and also exposed uh, fake clinics, like religious run clinics that would um, offer services to pregnant people. Um, but really, it was all, you know, all about discouraging people from trying to, uh, from t uh, having an abortion. Um, so we would call them fake clinics and um, Minneapolis and other chapters too, like would uh, expose these clinics. Uh, Columbus ARA helped with clinic defense, uh, escorting patients to and from uh, clinics uh, to access healthcare. Uh, Toronto ARA, we organized against the most extreme anti-choice organizations from the US when they came up to our neck of the woods. Um, Kitchener Waterloo ARA, which was like a smaller city kind of near Toronto, um, interfered with anti-choice pickets at their local hospital. I mean, those are just some of the stories that we shared. I mean, there were many more, um, uh, but we couldn't really cover everything. So that's another thing I just want to acknowledge <laughs> um, in terms of the book is that uh, there are stories that are just not here um, because we didn't have the networks or we just weren't able to reach people. And one of the weaknesses of the book um, that is relevant, particularly on this call, I think, is that there's not that much about the American South in the book, um, which is really unfortunate. I mean, the, really the strongest part of ARA in the period that we're talking about was the Midwest um, and neighboring Ontario. Um, but there were ARA folks organizing definitely in Nashville, in, uh, sorry, in Asheville and uh, in Texas and in Florida and just the coverage of some of their achievements and successes and challenges is weaker than we would have liked. Um, so maybe that's a, a blog post for another day. <laughs> um, uh, uh, oh, before I leave chapter six though, and the pro-choice chapter as we might call it, um, we, I, we also just want to note that the chapter also documents how ARA decided to incorporate a pro-choice position in the points of unity of the ARA network. So these points of unity uh, were the only defining platform of ARA, right? Um, so this matters. And I don't think we talked about them before, but um, basically the first one was as the title of the book, we go where they go, wherever Nazis are organizing or active in public, we're there right? We don't believe in ignoring them or staying away from them. So that was the first, we go where they go. The second was uh, uh, don't rely on the cops and the courts. The third was non-sectarian defense of other anti-fascists. And the fourth was a kind of broad anti-oppression statement, right? We're against racism, sexism, homophobia, discrimination against the disabled, um, anti-Semitism, you know. So we but those were, that was the original four points. And it took uh, a couple of years, but eventually ARA did adopt a explicitly um, pro-choice position and add it to the fourth point of unity, right? And um, the reason why I think this is interesting in retrospect is like that it wasn't a given. There were people who didn't want to add it, you know, not not too many because they were against choice, but there was a lot of concern about just like opening up the points and, um, you know, engaging in that kind of debate. But people really wanted to have that debate. And uh, in the end, it happened and there was a really positive outcome to that. So I think that there's two interesting pieces about that, which is one is just that grassroots anti-racist, anti-fascist really felt it was important and necessary to address uh, the Christian far right, which was working so hard and still is to limit reproductive freedom 
and that, you know, grassroots anti-racist and anti-fascist like connected that uh, practically speaking and politically speaking to the fight against the uh, organized racists in the far right. So that's the first thing. But the second thing also that Air 8 wasn't all one thing, that there was a lot, there was political difference within the network and people were able to productively work through those differences and um, kind of advance something over time. And that's, you know, kind of special because it doesn't always happen. So um, I think uh, that's, 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 those are my points for today, I think. And I look forward to any questions or discussion about it. Uh, oh, except that we're going to go back to Shannon because we want to talk more about youth culture, right? Um, yeah, and I can um, I can be brief because I think we were discussing earlier that like questions are really cool. Um, so yeah, no pressure. Don't want it to be like work. But um, yeah, we were kind of discussing how like Zoom sometimes can, Zoom is its own world. We, we want your questions. So uh, I will go into a bit about um, Aries Connections to youth culture. Um, I'll be relatively brief. Uh, and while I'm doing that, you can be uh, only pretending to listen while you actually rack your brain to come up with deep and insightful questions. Um, I know, but yeah, so uh, I will, um, yeah, get started on um, Aries Connections to youth culture and and why we think that um, they matter and that they're interesting. Um so I'll, I'll bring together a couple of things that both Chris and Michael already said. Um, so we talked about, and with the quote, like for example, from Jerry about uh, Aries hard work against the Klan um, and the Klan is kind of this like many headed Hydra and it's all over the Midwest and ARA is going all over as well. Um, that's really what builds um, ARA and what um, pushes ARA to form a um, like network structure um, when it started in those skinhead scenes, it was not super, um, people were getting together and they were like having con or like conferences, for example, intercity there, you know, there were like social ties, but it was in this context of the clan that in 1994, um, ARA formalizes a, uh, national network and that gives some structure. Um, and, uh, so that's when, as Chris mentioned, like you have Columbus, for example, as this chapter, uh, that has a chapter of the book, no, excuse me, chapter of. ARA that is not a chapter of the book um, that had like um, office space and was sort of um, a really important node and contact point for lots of people getting into uh, contact with ARA as a network at first. Um, that then um, allows ARA to really sort of springboard um, and grow a lot with this youth culture stuff. We talked about how ARA was pretty closely connected uh, to youth culture from its beginning and they really rose out of each other. Um, of, uh, yeah, I mean, at the, at the start, it was very literally about like control of like punk venues and like getting together and getting your friends together to uh, fight and kick out Nazis so that you could like safely have a show without, um, uh, you know, you have the bigger group and you kick the Nazis out rather than you being alone and the 10 Nazis come up and beat you up. Um, and so that goes back a long time. And then it's the like late 90s when, um, a lot uh, when when ARA sees really really huge growth, um, very significantly thanks to these connections to culture. Um, this is kind of when, you know, there's there's something of a, um, you know, for like certain, uh, we we don't need to get into like a history of uh, punk rock because that's boring. <laughs> but. Um, for a, for a sort of certain uh, subset of it, the 90s is, you know, it's like the start of like the Warped Tour and the Warped Tour was like not as big as it is now, um, but like still pretty big, but still had connections to like underground youth culture um, and some credibility there. And so like ARA is getting in touch with the, uh, with like bands on the Warped Tour. Uh, they meet um, the Mighty Mighty Boston's at like Lollapalooza. Um, Avail, a uh, very seminal uh, emo hardcore band out of DC, uh, or out of Virginia rather. Um, like, uh, there's also the Smoking Grooves tour was like the first national uh, hip hop tour. There was Rage Against the Machine touring. Um, these are all bands that like um, basically did the same thing uh, starting in like 1997, 
of uh, groups like bringing ARA alongside them on tour. Um, and then, you know, ARA sort of hits the road and is, uh, I was going to say going national, like it's always been national and has these different uh, chapters, but this is ARA very specifically having like a traveling opportunity to talk to people who might be interested um, and sort of promote the model. And then maybe, you know, five kids come up and say like, oh, this seems really cool. And they sign up for the mailing list. And then afterwards, the person says, hey, like all five of you said that you're interested and you're in the same town. So you can get together and like start an ARA chapter if you want to. Um, and so this is a huge way that ARA really, really um, massively expands just in like numbers and geographic reach that um, that's when ARA hits its peak uh, in like 1990. Eight, I believe, is when it's like almost 200 chapters uh, active at one time. Um, that number is, again, uh, thanks to Jerry, um, th that, um, yeah, that's that's like there's a there's a very significant um, uh, that that like would not have happened without ARA's ties to youth culture. Uh, and we don't want to go too far in that direction either. And we don't want to say that like everyone in ARA was a punk or that like you have to care about punk to like care about ARA. Um, but uh, basically, we we think it matters that like ARA had this like recruiting ground uh, that it could come out of and that it could get support from and get recruits from, uh, as well as that ARA went back in too. And so just as uh, ARA grew out of the uh, youth scene, youth scenes were really impacted by ARA and the work ARA was doing, um, you know, most obviously with the beginning of like saying that uh, punk is going to be like anti-fascist and like Nazis are not going to be welcome at punk scenes. Um, like that really goes without saying today in a way that I think it's like, it's really cool. It's easy to think that that like goes without saying, like I just said, but like there is maybe an alternate history where like that wasn't a thing and like Nazis could still be casually showing up to punk shows today and like punk scenes could be a place where Nazis can go and recruit. Um, the fact that it's like the exact opposite of that and where punk, you know, despite, um, its shortcomings or despite, you know, people who are not all that political about it uh like punk still has a very uh is still like a, a pretty meaningful place where a lot of people are sort of hearing for the first time so like uh meaningful critiques of our society basically um we think that's uh that that's cool both for punk and for uh well punk slash sort of youth counterculture in general um and for ARA that those connections were really significant um yeah, so um, I could say more, but trying to keep it at a reasonable time. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and we can go into uh, some questions, unless uh, Mike or Chris has anything to add, or Liberty, before we start questions. Yeah, uh, um, thanks you all for giving us the, the kind of like introductory context. I think you've done a really good job of highlighting a lot of what's in the book. Um, there is so much here to explore. And I really love the way that it's, y'all don't describe it this way, but it read sort of like an oral history. I mean, you obviously interviewed so many people um, and it's so story-based. Uh, really encourage everybody to pick the book up. Kind of the most amazing thing about the book, to me anyway, is that it's not like one of a bunch of books about the history of ARA. Like it's, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of the first history of ARA in book form. I, I know that there were some shorter histories written for periodicals. Uh, <clears throat> but that's pretty mind-blowing considering the degree to which understanding the history of, of ARA is really kind of essential to contextualizing and understanding contemporary anti-fascism. Um, and I guess but we have some great questions in the queue, but before we dive into them, I, I do want to ask y'all just if you wouldn't um, mind sharing a little bit about what, what is the relationship between the historic ARA and kind of our contemporary kind of Antifa. And I will say that I like avoid talking about Antifa because it is such a boogeyman um, for the far right. Uh, but clearly there are people organizing under the banner of Antifa. Um, and uh, whether people are organizing under that banner or not, they're operating in the legacy of ARA. Would y'all be willing to say a little bit about, um, I know it's not the subject of the book, but kind of how ARA transitioned us into this current moment of anti-fascist organizing? 
trying to unmute. Um, yeah, I think you're right to frame the context that that's the book we didn't write. Um, but I think you're also right that there are lots of linkages. Um, and, you know, you can see, I think, one of the big questions we had when we were working on the book was, where do we end our narrative? Recognizing that all the way into 2023, there are collective groups across the United States that call themselves ARA, recognizing that there was an ARA network until 2013, recognizing that things continued, but what we began to focus on as a kind of dividing line was the shift um, toward a more kind of security conscious modality of organizing. And I think that's the place where you can see the transition to what you know, becomes contemporary anti-fascism, particularly when you're looking at how do anti-fascists stand up against people like uh, you know, Richard Spencer in the middle 2010s, right? Um, and, you know, I, I'm confident that if you did a, a census, probably the FBI has done some of this mapping, right? They could find that there were people that were actively involved in ARA that subsequently became involved in continuing forms of anti-fascist activism today. Um, I think that that move toward security culture as the kind of, um, sort of um, the base minimum level uh, signaled a real shift away from the stuff that all three of us, I think, talked about in different ways, this attempt to balance or to combine uh, a level of intense militant struggle with a kind of mass or public facing organizing effort. And it, you know, the, in, in my mind, at least, I won't speak for my co-authors, but in my mind, that is, that's a, a loss. It's an understandable loss, recognizing the way in which things have changed. It's, a, it's an understandable loss, but it is a loss. The other thing that happens simultaneously, and I wanna sort of disaggregate them, although I think they are connected, is the rise of the internet, right? I mean, we, we were an email-oriented universe. I have a specific memory of Jerry teaching me how you could create a Hotmail account that had some random name that wasn't you. Um, and, you know, that was a thing, right? Like that was our tech. Um, and to operate in a world of social media um, is a radically different environment. And I think, I can't remember, it might be Kieran, somebody says late in the book that a lot of people, a lot of older folks in ARA, you know, we didn't think we were old then, but we were older than some, um, missed the boat on the importance of internet-based organizing. That we thought everything is gonna happen in person um, and that's how we need to respond to it. And, and missing the ways in which the far right was incubated with uh, within this universe of the internet. And the younger generation of anti-fascists got that in, like implicitly and reacted in, I think, ways that are really appropriate to that shift in the context. So that's the place where I would say, you know, the thing that we got wrong, they got right. Um, but at the same time, there are these other places where I wish we would see more of a commitment to public facing um, as something that has to be balanced with security culture. Does that make sense as an answer? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And I guess there's, there is also like kind of a direct lineage between the kind of and uh, the ARA network that eventually transformed into the torch network, um, which is still active. And I know, uh, you know, may, may not be as big as the uh, ARA network was in the late 90s, but is, is still a pretty substantial player when it comes to anti-fascist work. Um, so looking at questions that people have uh, have written in, and there's some really good ones here, um, maybe we could uh, just kind of start with this question of ARA's impact, which I think y'all have already touched on a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, but I, I think it, it would be great to hear any other thoughts on kind of what uh, the kind of post-ARA era impact of ARA really has been 
And I know that, I'm, you know, oh, go ahead. I'm going to say I fucked up and I was reading the, the written Q&A as you were reading the Q&A out loud. So I'm, was it the one from Todd? What do you think ARA's impact was after its downturn demise? Does something come to mind that you see as a result of your work as ARA? Is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's the question. Um, yeah, and it, you all have definitely touched on this already, um, but I, I think it's so important, you know, kind of in terms of like what are the what are the takeaways? So worth worth addressing again if you've got more thoughts. Um, Chris, do you want to take this one since Mike took the last one? And I was, I feel like, you know, it's downturn demise that we put in the book. I was seven at the time, so I'm interested in your uh, your view. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think I quite get it, the question, to be honest. Like, I think, like, yeah, the, 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 the I think the biggest impact of ARA was probably in the subcultures, right? Like, kind of shoring up or, like, making sure that fascists couldn't use these subcultures as a recruiting ground for them, right? And they kind of don't do it anymore, right? They don't try that much. But that's like the single biggest thing that happened. But, but as I said, my, you know, comments, I think like what was kind of special about it was that this, and, and people are in political struggle within their, within their scene all the time, you know, like there are all kinds of struggles around racism or sexism or homophobia, like happening within all the cultures and subcultures and scenes that there are right so this was like what was happening in the you know punk skinhead kind of youth counterculture you know there's a lot of white people but not only you know and at all and so like that's kind of what was happening but but because there was something about the organizing that made it possible to go beyond that you know like people were able to get beyond that and have these concrete um, victories against specific far-right organizations, right? And I think that's a victory. I mean, like in Toronto, the far-right didn't reemerge, didn't come together as another, as with another group for 20 years, 25 years. I mean, it's a big deal, you know? Um, so, you know, we can feel good about those things, right? Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that it was like a learning, a place of learning and skills development for a whole bunch of people. So that's also part of the legacy of ARA, right? Like, and there's, you know, lots of cool things that people did and people got to have experiences and meet people that they wouldn't have met otherwise, you know, because we were actually trying to like get outside of our comfort zone and take risks and like, you know, develop bonds of trust and friendship across all kinds of barriers that might not have ever done. So I don't know. I think I wanted to just highlight that. I could add, I think, in terms of a concrete thing that outlasts that era of ARA, one thing that we did talk about, we write about it briefly in the, in the final chapter, is ARA took a lot of arrests. And we took very seriously the notion of collectivizing defense funding right, that we did, um, you know, various versions of. Uh, and uh, some of those have, you know, still basically exist. The, the, um, I think the, the best example is the Canadian one that is kind of linked up with this international anti-fascist defense. But there's also the smaller, more obscure kind of thing. In Chicago, we had uh, the Chicago Anarchist Defense Fund, which was established in, um, I think, 2000, something like that, because we were taking so many arrests. And when, you know, it kind of went dormant after a while, but there was still some money in the bank. And in the aftermath, I think it was the aftermath of Michael Brown's killing in Ferguson, Missouri, um, Chicago organizers of a newer generation developed the Chicago Community Bond Fund, which was designed to support people who were taking arrests at Black Lives Matter protests. And the people who had the sort of keys to the bank account for the old Chicago Anarchist Defense Fund took their money and they put it in there. And the Chicago Community Bond Fund is massive. They're one of these <clears throat> sort of generation of excuse me, community defense oriented structures that exist all across the United States. 
I think that that is a really concrete tactile legacy of ARA. And we were a tiny, tiny contributor to what exists today, but, but there is that, that lineage connects. I think something that's not like quantifiable in, in, in the book, um, but also just, you know, being a, a kind of a youth gateway to kind of left politics, just an incredible number of people over the course of three decades, like were radicalized and got their start doing political organizing in ARA. Um, and I mean, I, th I think you'd be hard pressed to find almost any community um, with a vibrant left where there aren't folks who cut their teeth doing, you know, street level work with ARA. Um, maybe if we can grab another question here. Um, we've got one uh, from someone who notes. Um, so uh, I wonder, here, I'll, I'll just read it directly because it's a little lengthy. Uh, I wonder if you all could talk more about some of the details of how you connected militant confrontational tactics with mass organizing slash being an open organization. Were there particular challenges that arose from this and how did you address them? This feels especially important today with the prevalence of surveillance, et cetera. And it also feels really critical in order to grow our movements. Um, and I, I do, yeah, I would love to just hear a little bit more about the tension that y'all have highlighted um, because it, it both feels super real. And at the same time, you know, the, the idea, I mean, obviously ARA members were being surveilled, targeted and arrested by uh, state, you know, security services. And on the flip side, like contemporary anti-fascists have organized, you know, mass demonstrations. Um, I'm thinking about um, something like the Unite the Right rally, right? Which, um, you know, the way in which it was organized may look really different than the way organizing was done in the 90s. Uh, but it's not like anti-fascists have entirely abandoned the idea of mass struggle. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe a, a little bit more about that tension and uh, and how y'all how y'all navigated that. I, I think there's a lot of different ways you could go about talking about this. One that comes to mind now that we've just talked about you know, defense funds um, is a particular challenge was how do you get people involved in work where they could get arrested? And um, I think there were two kind of responses from ARA that were used in different ways to bring people in. And one response was the more of us there are, the less risk of arrest there is, right? That mass presence in the streets, unless you get into a situation where you're going to be completely kettled by the cops, which does happen. But in general, if there are more people involved, it lowers the risk for any individual person who's involved. And that was a, an argument that I think a lot of people, a lot of younger people in particular, found appealing. Um, obviously, the stakes and the nature of the risk of arrest is very different today. Um, but that was something that I think mattered in a lot of ways, that we were able to sort of popularize the value of mass action. And then the other thing was that we did, you know, nobody's perfect, but we did a pretty good job of supporting the people who did take arrests. And that I think was something that mattered to a lot of people. That's a very practical answer to that question. And there's a lot of other ways we could address it, but that's one particular aspect of how we tried to make that kind of stuff work, I guess. Um, yeah, I would maybe I, I'm, I think this is a great question. And I'm interested in it because um, literally, it's the first thing that I remember, like really blowing my mind about ARA was learning like, wait, so you guys were like, like you had more than like 10 people at a meeting, like, that is crazy. That's wild to me. Um, that was really the first thing that really, um, again, that just I remember really noticing. Uh, and so I, I think it is a really interesting question uh, with the caveats that Liberty correctly pointed out that like, um, we don't want to act or, or like, you know, wag our finger at like, it's not, it's not like anti-fascists today have completely abandoned the idea of like mass organizing. And so it's important to acknowledge that. But um, yeah, I would say, I think on a very personal or on a, on a very practical level, rather, um, I think one thing ARA did was that it, um, 
did lots of stuff besides um the militant stuff and so it was um like if you didn't want to like take an arrest you could still join ARA um and like basically that it was I'm I'm wondering if this is going to come out sounding like tautological like oh ARA managed to be public because it was public but a little bit I feel like it was that like they said like hey anyone can come join and so like a person who doesn't have a ton of experience or isn't already a committed person um could come in we talked about that quote from Steve of like um you know you could have like 15 year olds and like you know 45 year old like grizzled veterans grizzled is a strong word to use for a 45 year old sorry but you know uh but uh um yeah sort of in the same room that I think that sort of let me tr let me try to boil down to like what my point is that I think um ARA in being public facing um let, okay I'll 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 take a different tack that like ARA's public facing work it was not like hey we're going to have a meeting where we discuss the illegal thing we're going to do and that's going to be public like that's that's not what it was and they had these you know national networks where lots of different people were invited um and probably when you you know it's not like you know 2 p.m felony conspiracy session uh like it's you know the the there's a time and a place and you know that like when you're at this like conference where there are people from all over the country and people you don't necessarily know um that you're discussing like sort of you know maybe questions of like theory and questions of movement building and even just getting to know each other and like building those ties so that then when an action does happen then people are coming in um that like at the more public facing things uh is not when you are are doing super illegal things and so you can have that uh accessible thing that people can show up into and have that sort of have sort of a feeder I guess um that then you're you build that trust over time and then you know if there's going to be like a, a militant confrontation or something that is even if it is planned in advance it's probably not planned in that same um very open way and it's planned among people who at this point do know each other and do trust each other um I hope that's not too obvious to say but I guess like in a word I would maybe say that like ARA kind of had like some of that sort of like feeding mechanism of being accessible and then you could sort of get more committed over time whereas like I don't know today what like I don't know what like the first step is that leads someone who's like 18 years old now to be in like a you know really serious like black block affinity group anti-fascist group like three years from now like I'm pretty sure you know probably at least one one 18 year old who's alive today will be involved in like militant closed off anti-fascism in three years but like I I genuinely as someone who like I think that I'm like in this sort of movement in this anarchist movement I don't even know what that like progression is whereas ARA you sort of it it, it you did see what an entry point was of like oh here's something I can do even if I'm not gonna go crazy like here's a group that I can get involved with as a grizzled old man from the outside <laughs> I think the cop city stuff in Atlanta is that space right a space where people can be involved at a really wide array of militancy and that seems really impressive to me I don't know how sustainable it is but I, I think it's an important element of what that looks like in our present moment from again from very much the outside That's a really great point. Um, so uh, let's see, I know we are sort of starting to approach the end of our time and um, uh, Gary has come up a number of times in the conversation and is in the audience and I am not super technologically sophisticated but I found a big blue button that says allow to talk. So Gary, I'm gonna try pressing that button and see if you wanna weigh in and um, share reflections on really any of the the prompts and topics we've been been talking about. So, okay, you, can you hear oh, me? Excellent. Oh, yes. All right. First things first. Um, haven't seen all of you in well, two of you in a long time, and one of you ever 
speaking of grizzled veterans, the years have been kinder to a lot of you than me. <laughs> and thank God my camera's off. <laughs> um, but my your beard is still not bigger than mine. Now, my first question is, how can I help you with this presentation since I'm here? Um, well, Gary, we are um, we're actually kind of at the end of our time. I know there's one more question in our queue that we're going to circle back to in a minute. Uh, but I think if you wanted to share any reflections on this question of the tension between um, mass organizing and militancy um, or the legacy and successes of ARA, if you wanted to briefly touch on either of those two, I think your perspective would be uh, enormously appreciated. Okay, from my ex my experience in Columbus um, and in Texas and in Asheville twice briefly, um, but especially Columbus and Texas, you're going to jail. You're going to go to jail, but definitely in Columbus and our situation there, we had great lawyers. You're going to jail, but you're not going to prison. Um, you're getting out, but more importantly, you're going to win the court case. And then when I arrived in Texas in 2003, and, you know, I'm part of a small group, then the Iraq war breaks out, and we have four people that know what they're doing and 40 high school students. And we just invaded Texas, essentially. So we're training, 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 training. And this is in the context of there's going to be cameras everywhere. So when we're training in our combatives, we trained to let the Nazis take the first overt move. So it looks like self-defense in Texas. Right down to literally training ourselves to counter a punch to the face by headbutting them in the fist. I know that sounds crazy, but it and but it worked. And in general, again, a lot of confrontation, some arrests, zero convictions. And that's what's important. In this whole time, from 1986. Up until now, no member of ARA at no action has ever been convicted of a felony. Very few have been convicted of a misdemeanor, and very few of those misdemeanors have been above disorderly conduct. Give me 100 bucks. Okay, here you go. Goodbye. And that's important is one of the balances there is there's, there's going to be a mass militancy, but also there's a department of getting away with it sort of there's a institutional or cultural knowledge of okay this is one thing within a campaign let's keep our heads together and if something's got to happen we might not go all go home tonight but none of us are going to the hospital none of us are going to the morgue and everybody will be home after the weekend's over and is going to stay home. And that that was an important thing. And that's something that we can translate. OK, the cameras are always on. OK, they're going to know who you are. I use my real name in the book because even though I've got a degree in computer security, it's pointless to hide my identity at this point. I don't care. You know, Nazis want to come by, come get some. But more importantly, <clears throat> Knowing what I know about surveillance, it's so ubiquitous, you turn that around and surveillance is proof of your innocence of the charges. And there is a certain framework of legalism where I'm not the one who came to the rally with the, you know, like, I'm, you know, you th might not throw the first punch, make sure you throw the last. And that's a thing that can be translated to people doing this sort of stuff today. If that's helpful. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, 
I know that we, uh, there's like so many questions that we've gotten that are fantastic that I'd love to spend more time on. Um, but in the um, interest of respecting folks' time who thought that we were gonna be ending after 90 minutes, uh, I wanna just um, see if we can uh, circle around to one final question here, which we've got in the Q&A. Um, and that question is about uh, the question of um, disability justice. So. Uh, the, the person who submitted this question noted that the fourth point of unity includes discrimination against disabled community um, and uh, kind of to pull that into the present moment. I, I think it's, it'd be interesting to reflect both on how that did or didn't come up um, for ARA, uh, but also uh, this individual notes that, you know, being where we're at uh, in the pandemic, a lot of leftists have uh, embraced their privilege of good health shed their masks and left disabled community behind um, and ask with Michael Novick's uh, analysis of privilege in mind, how can we advocate for and include the disabled community in current liberation movements? And I will say that I, I know that every every community um, that was in the streets in 2020, you know, I, every time I saw a photo, I always saw folks um, with visible disabilities participating. I know um, that many of my friends uh, who have visible and invisible disabilities have been on the front lines of struggles over the last few years. Uh, but it is a really important point uh, about the degree to which we do or don't prioritize um, inclusion within our movement. So I'm wondering if uh, Shannon, Michael, and Kristen, um, if you all have any, any thoughts on this question, both in terms of the history of ARA and also in terms of our present moment. Um, I can speak to this a little bit and I don't uh, claim I, we can't, you know, we didn't make it a focus of the book and it wasn't a focus of the work, although I would say that it definitely was something that would come up in the Toronto chapter. Um, there were, um, when we had a big you know, we had one large conference in 1996 and we had a presentation that was specifically about um, the psychiatric industry and its relationship with the development of fascism. Um, so I think there was an awareness um, about the historical links, you know, that fascism is like kind of ableism exploded, right? Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, trying to, you know, trying to be accessible as a movement is sort of core, right? But I'm not saying that we did a great job of it, you know, or made it always very explicit. Um, but I, I think that the, the, you know, the being accessible and being open to everybody who has sort of a stake in the fight um, is, uh, you know, is pretty important for anti-fascism, even if not every, action is accessible the fight is always accessible the, there's so many different ways to participate and contribute and they all matter you know so whether it's doing it in front of a computer or it's cooking food for an action or it's writing letters or making phone calls or being like the person who's like on the legal defense line at a demo, like there's so many ways to contribute, right? And um, I think we did in the book kind of try to address how different people would have feel that they could participate in different ways. And so one of the things that we talked about in the book was that kind of idea of like the red, yellow, and green zones of the demonstration. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know if we actually use incorporated that quote in the end, but it came up in Quebec City, right, in the uh, the protests against the Summit of the Americas, you know, that you would try to organize the public actions in such a way that it would be kind of clear what your proximity to the confrontational aspects would be, right? And that would help um, with accessibility. But I mean, there's no guarantees, right? There's no guarantees because, you know, we, we, you know, we are in, in a struggle, in a conflict, right? So I guess those are my, my thoughts on the subject. And I really um, thank 
the person for bringing it up. It's hard to stop because there are several more really good questions and I would love to keep talking. Um, but I think that our time together has come to a close. Um, so uh, if there's any final final thoughts, um, I wanna make space for that. And I also just wanna really encourage everybody to uh, pick up a copy of this book. You can get it from us on our website, uh, but oh my gosh, it's so blurry. <laughs> Trust me, there's a real book here. Um, thank you. Uh, or, or no doubt find it in your local indie bookstore as well. Just don't buy it from Amazon. Um, yeah, any, any closing thoughts? Thank you uh, again so much for being here with, with me tonight. Thank you for hosting. Absolutely. Yeah, this, I just really enjoyed the conversation. I felt like the questions were really great. So thank you everybody for, for being here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, extremely grateful to everyone coming in uh, and coming out and especially yeah for like a good 100 minutes feels really cool very grateful that people uh care for 100 minutes so uh yeah and thanks for hosting this firestorm liberty absolutely and i i hope that people read this book and folks who are part of ARI chapters that aren't really represented in this history will write zines and essays and blog posts um i would love to see kind of a flourishing of people's history of anti-racist action um, come out of these conversations. All right, y'all have a great evening and we will talk to you again soon.